and there we go. How's the weather out by you? We're slowly warming up, slowly warming up. I think later this week, we're gonna be in the 70s. Okay. It'll be nice. We, I think, you know, we've had a couple spurts in mid April, but for the most part, it's been, I think for the most part of relatively predictable spring, cool, sure. wet, snow, rain. Yeah. Kind of a mixed bag. We're, we're still a couple weeks off from planting um because ground temperatures are still on the cool side you know you could sure. get some cool weather veggies direct sown some peas and beans and stuff but yeah. for the most part, still a couple weeks off I mean being here in the northeast the extreme northeast we're in northern Vermont okay um, you know we have a very short growing season you know mid to end of May through you know end of September October oh wow you know because like I said we had snow last week and oh my gosh <laughs> when, when we do get those kind of pop-up if they, you know, if we get a, a, a frost that comes in, those frosts can be like 20 degrees. And so it can really, from a gardening standpoint, it can really wreak havoc sometimes and yeah. present some challenges, but um, it's just, it just tends to be an intense planting in, in, in the long <laughs> time, you know, cause it's, it's so yeah. short and condensed, but. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. But do you adapt and you know, you find things that grow best in your climate, you know, and you yeah. know, talk about the importance of zone and regions and stuff. So I think you adapt accordingly. And there's plenty of really cool vegetation and flora that you can, you know, you can establish. It's just, I think, understanding it and a little trial and error sometimes. And sure, you know, so, but uh, no, I got a big weekend. I'll be out the veggie garden, getting that prepped. I'll do a few things direct so, but for the most part, I'll probably wait another couple of weeks. I'll I'll usually buy my tomato plants and peppers because again, with such a short growing season, if yeah. you don't start them, you know, it can be challenging sometimes. But um, I'll do a little direct sowing this weekend, and then sure. um, I enjoy. I got into dahlias last year, and so I'll be planting some of those, and they can be challenging too. Like last year, for instance, everything was growing great. And we got an early frost, like mid September, oh, no. but it would, again, it was hard, like 20 degrees. And I didn't go out, like you would have to put a blanket and cover them. And I didn't. And oh, just no. one hard frost, they were gone. And it stunk oh, no. because not only were a bunch of them in bloom, which were really pretty, but I had a bunch that hadn't even flowered yet that were like big oh. buds and lost them all, you know? So, oh, no. yeah, it's kind oh, of man. a little bit of a bummer, but uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I love dahlias. They're one of my favorites. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I get into them last year. There's, they're just so much fun and they're super easy, you know? Yeah. But the colors, they come in now and this, the sizes of them. I have a, I have a 10 year old daughter and, uh, yeah, we have some, you know, grow as big as her head, the dinner plates, dinner plates. Yeah. They're just fabulous. So. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Really enjoy it. Very cool. All right, it looks like we've got 16 in so far. We'll wait another minute here before we get started. Um, and then we'll we'll turn it over, but we'll wait, we'll wait one more minute here. Uh, let a few more people filter in. Sounds great. Hi everybody, Hi, everybody. if you can see me. <laughs> there should be a little like waving icon so we can see people like wave back or. <laughs> something yeah oh there we go okay i see now the list of people perfect right. yeah i see that all right
Yeah. All right, I'm going to link us here onto Facebook. We'll start that up. All right, I think we're live there. Right. A plus for your technical wizardry. <laughs> it takes a minute sometimes. Yeah. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight on Zoom or on Facebook. Um, and, and those who are tuning in later with our recording, uh, we're so glad that, that you're joining us here at Clem Arboretum and Botanic Garden um, for another um, uh, lecture series. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying hello. My name is Sam Burbach. I am the Director of Education and Programming, and I'm so excited to uh, get to have this program uh, tonight and feature Mike Lazat, uh, who's going to be teaching us all about uh, mini meadows. I uh, would like to say um, a big thank you. Uh, this webinar is made possible by the Pauline J. and John R. Cook Lecture Fund of the Community Foundation of Northern Illinois. Um, through this, we're able to, to have some great speakers for you all to learn something new about different areas of, of gardening and horticulture. So we, we really appreciate their um, support. Um, I'd also like to point out that it is still uh, Go Public Garden Days uh, that we're celebrating out at CLEM. So we've got free admission um, this week. It'll go until uh, this Friday. Uh, which is the 14th. Uh, so May 14th, we've got free admission the rest of the week. Um, we've got some little activity kits for kids that you could pick up in our main visitor center. Um, and, and you can check out what else is going on. We'll be posting stuff on our social media to see what else is going on. You can do a smartphone tour. You can do a scavenger hunt. And so lots of fun things going on. Uh, be sure to stop out I think our temperatures are going to be warming up later in the week, so it's a, a nice time to come out and see um, what all is blooming and, and spring coming to life out at the Arboretum. Um, so for this webinar, um, all of our participants, you all are muted. Um, if you've got questions, you can go ahead and type them into the um, Q&A box um, or the, the chat box. Um, we'll make sure to check both of those. If you're joining us through Facebook, um, you can put any questions you might have in the comment box. Um, and at the kind of at the end of the presentation, Mike will go back and will answer some questions. So we'll check both um, on Zoom and on Facebook uh, so we can make sure we've got um, all of your questions answered. So uh, be sure to type those in as they come up. Um, just know that we won't answer them right away. It'll be um, kind of at the conclusion of the, the presentation portion. And um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike uh, Lazak, and he is the seed man, and he's going to teach us all about um, mini meadows, something that's been a passion of his, uh, and that he's going to share how you can create this uh, for your own home. So without further ado, um, here's Mike. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks for that uh, great in introduction. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here. And Hopefully over the next hour, hour and a half, I will inspire you to go out this spring and create your own uh, mini meadow. So again, my name is Mike Lazat, and I've been slinging flower seed since the age of 13. I started um, when I was very young and uh, through my high school and, and college years, um, the business that I had worked for, which is American Meadows, was a family owned and operated company. And 
as it continued to grow, uh, the opportunity came up to purchase the company. And so myself and my business partner um, were fortunate enough to purchase American Meadows in the uh, January of 2009. And since we've gone on to acquire uh, two more gardening companies, uh, High Country Gardens and Landry's Seed as well. So currently I am a managing partner and owner of three different gardening companies. Uh, my passion has always been flower seed. Um, I've been fortunate enough um, to also have written a book recently um, called Mini Meadows, Grow a Little Patch of Colorful Flowers Anywhere Around Your Yard. Um, I worked with Story Publishing a couple of years ago, and that was a fun project um, and just really passionate. I've been fortunate. I, I speak at various um, flower shows around the country, the Philly Flower Show, Pacific Northwest Flower Show, uh, Connecticut Flower Show, etc. I am based in uh, the Northeast. Our corporate office is in um, uh, Shelburne, Vermont which is basically a suburb of Burlington. And um, just really enjoy, I've been fortunate enough in my 30 plus years of doing this to speak to hundreds and thousands of gardeners all around the country, um, helping them and inspiring them to, to plant um, flowers on their property. And so I guess without further ado, I'm gonna jump into my presentation. But as we mentioned, really like to have these uh, as interactive as possible. Um, I think we're here for hour, hour and a half, couple hours. Um, so certainly as I go through this presentation, and it's going to be relatively quick, um, get your questions down because really like to have a, an engaging question and answer at the end of the presentation. So, um, and also Clem will be getting a copy of this PowerPoint presentation as well. So hopefully we'll be able to share with all of you that you can go back and look at it at a, at a further date as well too. So um, okay, so without further ado, I am going to jump into uh, my presentation about wildflowers. And like I said, hopefully we'll inspire you when we're done to go out and plant um, this spring. So first, I'd like to start with, you know, why plant a meadow? And certainly there are a number of reasons um, that you may think about putting in a meadow. Certainly things you've heard about recently, the decline in bees and... Um, um, monarch butterflies and pollinators in general. Establishing or reestablishing habitat is a great way to support uh, pollinators. Uh, conserving water, you know, how much water goes into maintaining a lawn? It's a lot. So why not put it in a meadow which takes up less water? Um, just cultivating beauty in general. Um, what's better than looking out your window to a, a, a field or a meadow of wildflowers? Um, I happen to have a 10 year old daughter. She, we love every year going out and planting our meadow and seeing the flowers grow and how quickly they grow and educating and learning not only about pollinators, but the life cycles of the plants that we'll get into and so on. So it's a great way to engage kids as well. And then obviously um, cutting down on mowing and the environmental impacts, which obviously these touch on a number of them, but you know, how much hydrocarbon does, does your mower emit? It's a lot, you know, and so cutting back on mowing. So again, a number of reasons why meadow plantings in mini meadows and wildflowers in general have really kind of come to the forefront in the gardening sector, say over the last three to five years, we've really seen a, a pretty big resurgence. Now, one thing I do want to share with you, when you hear, we talk about meadow and how I define a meadow in my book is, most people right away, they go to thinking that they need a big area. And that couldn't be far from the truth where the way I define meadow is it could be a planter box. It could be, you know, 50 square feet, or you could be fortunate to have a thousand square feet or 10,000 square feet or two acres. Meadow can be any shape or size somewhere where you could sprinkle down some seed and create some beauty. Or in some cases, you may start with plants or plugs, which we'll also get into. But any space that you can create a habitat of beauty with flowers um, is really how I define a meadow, you know, because again, I speak to people all over the country in all different types of situations and different sizes. And it's not like you need a thousand square feet or else you can't create a meadow. So hopefully again, we may have some people on this call who have limited space or they may live uh, in, in, a, in a high rise with just a planter box, you know, you'd be surprised at a little pack of seed, you sprinkle it down there and you can create what I would consider a mini meadow. So we're gonna jump into meadow planting 101 and I'm gonna go through quite a bit here. So again, take some notes, but you'll be able to go back and reference this 
uh, at a later time as well too. So we're inspired, we're thinking about putting in our meadow. So first and foremost is like, you have an area on your property you're thinking about planting is evaluating. And you can learn a lot just by looking around, you know, what's currently growing the area that you think that you want to plant in? Is there growth there currently? That's usually a pretty good sign that your soil is going to be pretty good. Is it patchy? Is it spotty? Is there bare spots around there? That could potentially trigger that there may be something wrong with the soil and you may sometimes do a soil test or fertilizer may come into the equation as far as establishing your meadow. But in most cases, if you just look around and you've got existing growth there, your soil is probably good enough to support a meadow. So again, just looking around. A lot of times when I'm talking to people right away, they go to, oh, my soil's not good. I need to bring in topsoil. I got to fertilize it. A lot of times that's not the case. Most people, again, as long as the area has supported growth previously and you look out and they're like, Mike, I've got an area and there's there's been grass and weeds growing there, thinking about planting some wildflowers. Nine times out of 10, that's a pretty good spot to establish some flowers. So you can learn a lot just by looking around in the area. Um, ideally, during this presentation, we're gonna be talking about establishing a meadow from seed. And so therefore, we really are looking for areas that are getting at least four hours of sun a day or more to establish a meadow from seed. So again, when you're looking around and just observing, okay, during the course of the day, how many hours of sun approximately is the area getting? If you're getting four or more hours of sun, that's a pretty good sign that you're gonna be very successful when establishing a meadow from seed. Now, if the area is getting less than four hours of sun a day, then you may turn towards plugs or plant material for establishing your meadow which is also very successful because again, remember when dealing with seed, you're gonna need at least four hours of sun for germination to take place. So that's important. So, but again, just evaluating in, in what's, what's currently growing there, how many hours of sun, you can really usually learn enough there that's gonna set you up um, to succeed when establishing a meadow. So in most cases, when I'm talking to people, we're not really getting soil tests done. Again, unless it's extreme where they have an area and it hasn't, they've tried to grow stuff in the past and they haven't been successful or there's lots of bare spots, et cetera. That might be a red flag that you may want to engage in getting a soil test. Most um, um, master gardener or um, a county extension services will do a soil test for free. And the beauty about a soil test is not only does it analyze and give you a full um, read of your soil composition, it usually will provide the best way to remedy it. Let's say it's um, high in acidity or it's it's nutri it's um, deficient in nitrogen or something. Getting a soil test done can be pretty beneficial in that regard because it'll tell you exactly how to um, address the situation. But again, in most cases, when I'm talking to customers, we're not really getting into soil tests because in most cases, there is some type of vegetation growing there, which is usually a sign that the area is um, good enough to establish um, wildflowers currently. So again, also when you're evaluating the area is understanding the soil conditions that you might have. Is it clay? Is it sandy? Is it loamy? It's important, but the beauty again, and one of the reasons why wildflowers tend to be really popular is they're adaptable to many different types of soil conditions. So, you know, even if you have clay, there's probably a good chance you're going to establish, you can establish flowers. What you're going to find when you're dealing with clay is they tend to be a little bit shorter than if you were dealing with a, a, a more well-drained, a more aerated soil, something like a sandy or a loamy soil. So again, one of the reasons why wildflowers are popular, tend to be popular, is they are very adaptable. Sometimes people get too hung up and, oh, my soil's clay, I can't grow anything, or it's too sandy, it doesn't hold moisture. A lot of times, and we'll get into this, is that there are if you choose the right flowers um, for those type of conditions, you can be very successful there. Um, planning for watering. Does the area that you're thinking about putting in your meadow, does it have act, do you have access to water? If not, possibly you wanna plan your planting around some moisture in the forecast, which will help with germination. In most cases, when I'm talking to someone about establishing a meadow or a mini meadow, their plan is not to be watering the area. Most, in most cases, people are just relying on the moisture from mother nature in order for their meadow to succeed and to sustain. Because again, getting back to the benefits of putting in a meadow 
we don't want to be watering the constantly like we, we may be doing with our lawn. We want to get away from that. We want to conserve water. And so in most cases, we're not relying on mother nature. So how can we use it in our favor? As I mentioned here, if you don't have access to watering, I was going to start my meadow in a couple of weeks. I might look at my forecast and say, hey, I've got some rain coming in. I'm going to prepare my area and I'm going to plan to sow and take advantage of that rain that's coming in um, to help with the germination process. So um, some ways that you can use that to your favor. So again, and also important when establishing a meadow is understanding your zone or your region. And again, the beauty and one of the reasons why wildflowers also tend to be popular is they're not as zone specific as other type of plant vegetation. As we're all aware, we go into our garden center nursery and we look at the plant tags and it says it's hardy for zone 7A or 7B or 4B or 4C. And it can be a bit overwhelming, especially if you're new to gardening. And Again, one of the beauties of wildflowers is they're not as zone specific as some of that perennial vegetation. Wildflowers are very adaptable across a number of, can be very adaptable across a number of different zones. So again, when we're talking with wildflowers, we're usually going more regional and talking region specific. For instance, I'm in the Northeast. Most of the attendees here are in the Midwest, Southwest, et cetera. You'll see at our company in American Meadows, we've broken the, the, the country down into six regions. And then we may go a step further, depending on if I'm talking to somebody on a microclimate or a micro, um, a micro zone or a micro region. For instance, I'm here in the Northeast, I'm in Vermont, and we have a lake here, Lake Champlain. So we get lake effect off that. So sometimes it can tend to be a little bit warmer um, when you're closer to there versus if you're more towards the mountains. So we may get there. But again, one of the reasons why the wildflowers tend to be popular is they're very adaptable over a number of zones, um, which makes it really popular. So I guess if I could give you one piece of advice, don't get too hung up on your zone. I think more is being able to identify where your region is. And if you can do that, you're probably going to, you will be able to find and select the proper mixture for your particular region and pick flowers that are going to do well for you. So, and then as I go throughout here, these are some photos of various meadows and mini meadows from customers. This one that you see here is a rock garden um, mini meadow out in Colorado. So as you can see there, very arid, very dry. Um, they did bring in some, um, some topsoil to establish that because as you see around it there, um, there's not as much vegetation, but they, they, they brought in some topsoil and it did very well. This was uh, a lawn uh, that was replaced with a mini meadow out on my property. Um, and that's in Vermont there. So uh, when we moved into our house about nine years ago, first thing I did was starting ripping out lawn. I ripped out a big chunk of lawn to put in my veggie garden then ripped out another piece of lawn to put in my mini meadow. So another important one, another important um, uh, piece of information when you are planting your meadow in flowers is understanding the life cycles of the flowers that you may choose for your particular planting. And as we know, there's three different life cycles when it comes to flowers. We have annuals, which we know their life cycles completed in one growing season. We have perennials, which are flowers that come back year after year from their root structure. And then we also have that oddball life cycle in there called biennials, which there aren't many in the plant world that fit under that, but that's a two-year life cycle. And it's really important to understand that when you're planning, um, because we know annuals from seed will flower in the first year. Perennials from seed, although we like the concept that they come back year after year, they're not going to flower the first year. So it's always important when you're selecting the flowers or the mixture or the, even, or the individual species, whatever the flowers you're putting in your mix is understanding because that's going to set you up for that, the proper expectation. I can't tell you how many times people will, I will be talking to someone and everyone loves the concept of perennials, as I mentioned, because they come back year after year. Well, they'll buy a mix of all perennials. And late that first year, they call me up and they're in a panic and they're like, Mike, I put in my perennials and I didn't get any flowers. What did I do wrong? And they did nothing wrong, but they just didn't realize that perennials from seed, most of the time aren't going to produce a lot of flowers in that first year. So that's where if your goal is to get some flowers in the first year and you want some instant gratification after you've done the work of preparing, you may want to incorporate some annuals into your mix. So again, really important to understand the different life cycles so that when you are talking to someone and 
For instance, let's say you're wanting to put in a meadow, not only to support pollinators, but um, you want to do some photography or you're hosting an event on your property um, or uh, whatever the case is, and you need or want color in the first year, you're going to want to make sure that you incorporate some annuals into your mixture. Um, people who are in it um, and they're not really worried about first year color, they understand how perennials work and that it will take two or three years, they may go with all perennials. So again, just really important to understand the different life cycles and a good quality mixture, whether you were to buy it from us or a company like Ernst or Prairie Nursery, Number one, not only are all the flowers going to be listed in the mix, but it will tell you the life cycles, of course, you know, so you'll know exactly which flowers are annuals, which ones are perennials, etc. That's really important. If you're talking to a company and they're hesitant or they're not giving you that specific information, that should trigger a red flag for you. So again, here with annuals, first year color, some of the more popular ones that we're all aware of, poppies and zinnias and bachelor buttons and sunflowers, um, phacelias, borage, galardia. I mean, the list goes on and on, but lots of flowers. But just again, important to understand in defining what an annual is. And as I mentioned, then we go into perennials. And again, perennials from seed, most of them aren't going to produce a flower in the first year because Normally they need to go through one dormancy cycle, which would be that winter after the seed has germinated in order for them to set their roots and then begin producing flowers in the second and successive seasons. And so just again, important to understand that when you're dealing with seed versus plant material. A lot of people don't realize when they go into a garden center or nursery and they see that pot of echinacea or asclepias um, that that plant has been grown for two, three years. They just think it was seeded and it's in flower. And they say, well, Mike, how come, you know, my echinacea didn't do that? Well, you didn't realize that plant you bought was two or three years old from the garden center. So just important to understand that. But perennials, again, long lasting color. You could have perennials for 20, 30 years. So again, with a little patience, lasting color year after year after year. Some of the more popular perennials that we sell, our customers really enjoy your echinaceas, your Asclepias or butterfly weed, your various lupins, various asters, various columbines, joe pie weeds, um, agastache, liatris, big list of perennials. And again, just important when you're thinking about the flowers and the life cycles that you want to incorporate into your mini meadow, understanding the perennials um, will go a long way, again, in understanding how your meadow is going to evolve, not only in the short term, but in the long term as well too. So important to know those life cycles. And then also the conversation of natives and non-natives, you know, obviously when we are talking about supporting pollinators, we want as much native in there as, as possible. But again, there are some non-natives. And I think it's really important when talking about a meadow and establishing and talking about plants in general is non-native versus um, noxious weeds, because there's a distinct difference. I think sometimes when we talk about non-natives, we immediately sometimes think about invasive species, and that's not necessarily the case. You know, there are things like zinnia, which we know is an annual. It's very pretty. Pollinators love it. It's native to Mexico. Um, it's not aggressive. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a pest species, etc. So just understanding non-native versus um, um, the invasive species and being able to define the two because there are plenty of non-natives that will do very, very well and fit nicely into a meadow setting. So important to understand that. So um, as we move along, so now we kind of understand and we're learning the different life cycles and trying to understand the, the type of flowers we want in our meadow, it's really important to get a sense of how big is the area that we're looking to establish um, our mini meadow. And obviously you can have squares, you can have all different shapes and sizes, but it's really important to know that size because the size of the area will dictate how much seed you're going to need for the particular project. So it's really important. It doesn't have to be exact science in, in to, the, to the, the, the inch or whatever, but to get a ballpark, do you have 10 square feet? Is it a planter box? It is a thousand square feet. It's gonna be important to determine that because that's gonna be really important in dictating how much seed you're gonna need. And a point to remember is, and a mistake people make often is, let's say we have a mini meadow and we're dealing with a thousand square feet. So uh, we've got say a, a, a 10 by a uh, hundred area. 
And people will say, well, Mike, send me 20 pounds of seed. And I say, well, you only have a thousand square feet. So with say our, our regional Midwest mixture or Midwest pollinator mixture, we would only recommend a pound of seed for a thousand square feet for a lush stand of flowers. And they say, ah, Mike, money's no object. Send me 10 pounds of seed. 10 pounds of seed is way too much. People think, oh, just put more seed, more seed, more seed. Well, believe it or not, there's a scientific formulation that goes into creating a wildflower mix. And it gets down to seeds per square inch. And I'm not going to bore you with that math tonight, but it's important. So putting 10 pounds of seed in that small area, what ends up happening is as the seed begins to germinate, if it even does, the seed is too compact. So when it begins germinating, it's just going to choke and it's going to be a failure. So something to always keep in mind, more seed is not the answer. So make understanding the correct size of the area and buying the proper amount of seed for the size area, that's what's really important here. So again, more seed is not necessarily the answer. So again, important to understand and get your square footage. And then once you've got that, and we understand the different types of flowers that we might be sowing, when is the best time to put in your meadow? So by far, spring is the most popular time. People will direct sow uh, a mini meadow. And um, for a number of reasons, I just think in general, people, when they think about spring, it's planting time. So it kind of makes sense. But fall is also a popular time, depending on where you, excuse me, where you are geographically, fall can be another time to establish a meadow as well too. But for the most part, we'll focus on spring planting because we're in spring and most of us, you being out in the Midwest and me in the Northeast, we are in planting or getting close to planting time. So spring, is by far the most um, popular time um, that people will establish in sow flower seed. Now, being in the Midwest where you are and similar to me in the Northeast, I always tell people don't be fooled by the warm air temperatures in the spring. So we have long winters. You guys know we get two feet, three feet of snow, it's 20 below zero. And after five months of that, we're like enough is enough. So that first warm air temperature day on April 15th, we have spring fever. We want to go out, we want to plant, and we want to do this, we do that. Well, we've been here, if you've lived here long enough, we know that that's not the best thing to do because we're probably still going to get some more snow and it's going to be cold again or whatever. So the key to having success with your meadow planting is not being fooled by the, the air temperature, but more importantly, being focused on the soil temperature. And the soil temperature, like a large body of water, it will take a while for it to gradually warm up. So again, be patient, let the ground temperature warm up. And ideally when your ground temperatures get above 55 degrees, optimal time to begin sowing. So here in the Northeast, we usually have a rule of thumb like mid to end of May, Memorial Day weekend. That's a big planting time for our area. Obviously it'll vary depending on where you are, but again, can't stress enough that the key is making sure the ground temperature has warmed up enough, not the air temperature, the ground temperature in order to promote and help with quick germination. Now, if you do happen to sow your seed a little early, let's say the ground temperatures are only in the 40s, it's not the end of the world. And it's not unusual that, especially in the Midwest and in the Northeast, again, we get spring fever and we get anxious and we put our seed down. And then I get flooded with calls like, Mike, I put my seed down, it's been three weeks and nothing's happened. Well, it's just because your ground temperatures haven't warmed up enough. There's nothing wrong, the seed isn't going to rot. You might get some, some of the birds and some of the critters might come and eat a few, but don't worry about that. But it's just, you might have sown it a little early. And when the ground temperature warms up, that seed will begin to germinate and you're going to be in good shape there. So spring is great. Get that soil temperature above 55 degrees and you're ready to plant your seed. You're going to be good to go. And again, just to touch on fall planting, it can work very well, especially in areas such as the Midwest and Northeast where we're from we have a short growing season. Doing a dormant or fall planting can be really popular. That is sowing your seed after you've had a couple of frosts and the ground is cool. You would put your seed down then. It'll lie dormant through the winter and then next spring when the ground warms up, that seed will trigger to germinate. And sometimes if mother nature cooperates, you can get a head start, sometimes a two to four week head start. But one of the disadvantages with the cold winters that we have, sometimes mother nature does not cooperate. So. For best success, if you've never done a meadow before, I would recommend a spring planting to be on the safe side. So 
we understand the life cycle. We know how big an area we have. We know when to plant. So now the most important part of establishing a meadow and ultimately determining your success is the proper preparation of the area. And there's a number of ways you can go about preparing an area. The most common way of prepping an area is doing a surface till. So what we wanna do is kind of ridding that surface layer of existing growth that might be there. Now, if you're opposed to tilling and you don't wanna disturb the soil that way, you can do solarization, which is basically taking, as you can see in my um, slide here, is taking either black plastic, clear plastic, and we do what's called solarization. This basically absorbs the heat from the sun and it basically burns out and kills all the weeds underneath. It works very, very well, can be very effective as well, but it can take time. And when I say time, it can take 30, 60, 90, 120 days. So you just wanna plan accordingly, depending on the type of preparation method that you might use, again, in planning the timing of your actual planting. So if I wanted to do a spring planting uh, here in the Northeast and I was going to do solarization, I might actually do the solarization in the previous fall, let it work its way through say late summer through the fall, let that stay on there for a number of months, come up in the springtime. And ideally if I were to pull that plastic away, everything would be dead underneath. And then all I would be doing is just scratching that surface layer and I'd be ready to, to, to sow my seed. Um, I prefer tilling just because it's quick, it's simple, it's easy. Um, and again, just doing a surface till, I'm not going down very deep, just a few inches, just to get rid of that existing growth. I'm gonna go over the area multiple times just to kind of grind it up. I'm gonna rake out any of the clumps and then I'm ready to sow my seed. And doing a till method, you can do the prep and you can do the sowing kind of all in one quick step, um, one after another. So again, from a timing standpoint, it can be quite convenient. So um, actually I'm going to be doing a tilling this weekend and I probably will wait about a week and then I'll be sowing the week after that. So, um, but again, in some cases I will till and I'll sow all in one day. So um, there's nothing wrong with that. So again, here, really important to spend the time preparing though, because ultimately this, the prep that you do is gonna determine success, not only in the short term, but in the long term as well. And I can't tell you how many times when people call me up and they say, Mike, you know, my meadow didn't quite turn out the way I wanted to. And we walk backwards. I say, okay, tell me what you did. And nine times out of 10, it's they don't spend enough time during the prep because we're anxious. So we just want to try to cut corners. And it always comes back to the kind of this area. Spend the time. I can't stress enough. If there's one area here, spending the time to get it right, the preparation is the most important. So spend the extra time there. And again, depending on the method you're going to use, just plan accordingly because some of these, like using some organic sprays, or solarization, they just can take a little longer. So um, plan accordingly there. So now we've gone ahead and we've prepped our area and we've chosen our mixture and we're ready to seed our, uh, our meadow. So dealing with, again, a company like American Meadows or a company like Ernst or whatever, all the seed that we're selling and handling is 100% pure flower seed. It's very different than you may have gone into a big box store and seen one of those meadows in a can or one of those bags with flashy meadow on the front. Those are usually 10% seed and 90% filler and they have the dispersing agent or whatever else in the bag. Everything we sell is 100% pure seed. Um, I think that's really important. All our seed is also lab tested to ensure the highest quality, purity and germination rates possible. So again, when you are talking with a seed company, hopefully it's ours, but if you're talking with a seed company, you should be making sure that they're giving you that information, understanding the purity and the germination. Um, again, along with the life cycles of the flowers that are in the mix, because you may choose one of our stock mixes at American Meadows, we offer over 50 different types of mixes, but you may also be creating a custom blend for your situation as well. So again, important to understand the life cycles on the bloom times, but also making sure you're buying good quality seed. So at American Meadows, again, everything we sell is pure seed. We are recommending, and all our products come with full instructions, but we recommend mixing our pure seed with a dispersing agent. And we found through our 
40 years of doing it, that we re recommend uh, builder sand or sandbox sand to help disperse the seed. And we find with our mixtures that the density of the flower seed mixes very well with the density of the sand. So when you begin mixing it together um, and you begin broadcasting, which you'll see shortly, you end up getting a nice even distribution of the seed across the area that we are looking to cover. And a tip here is if you're gonna use the sand, make sure the sand is dry because if the sand, like a 50 pound bag of builder sand or sandbox sand, it's very minimal cost. I think it's three or $4. But if it's wet or damp, it's gonna end up clumping. And it's not gonna, as you begin dispersing, it's not gonna disperse evenly. And if you were using a spreader, which you could certainly use if you're doing larger areas, a crank seeder um, or a backpack crank seeder, or even a, a twirly on a, a three hitch tiller if you were doing a big area. If the soil is wet or damp, it's going to clog and that's not gonna be good. So make sure your sand is dry there. You may hear other dispersing agents that sometimes people mix seed with like um, a kitty litter, uh, vermiculite, crushed walnut hulls. Uh, some of that may work, but we just find with our mixtures um, that sand tends to mix really, really well to get that nice even distribution. So you've got your seed and sand, you mix it together here. I'm just doing a pail and just I hand broadcast. Again, as I mentioned there, you could have a crank seeder as well too. I've gone, I, I go back and forth. I've sown acres by hand. Uh, it takes a little longer, but I sometimes find that you have the best control that way. Um, but any one of these will work. Another tip um, that I would might recommend if you are using a, a seeder and you've never used it before, and you're a little nervous if it's gonna, how well it's gonna spread, if it's gonna cover, is once you've mixed your seed and sand together, you break it up into equal parts, two equal parts, four equal parts. But before you even put that in your spreader, just take some extra sand, put it in the spreader, and most of them are gonna have an adjustment that's gonna allow for the seed to move through and you can adjust it accordingly. Always put it on the finest setting first, because I'd rather see you go over the area multiple times in multiple directions. And that way you're almost guaranteed a nice evenly sown meadow instead of making the mistake that unfortunately a lot of people will make is they mix their sand and seed all together. They put it in their spreader and they begin cranking and they've only gone over half the area and they've run out of seed and sand because they put it down too dense. And if you've done that, it makes it really hard to kind of thin it out. So in the instructions that come with all our seed products, and we talk about the sand and seed mixture and the proper ratio is breaking it up into equal parts or equal halves. So that way you don't end up making that mistake of putting it down too dense and not being familiar with the spreader application you might be using. So, and we always recommend uh, a broadcast method um, versus sometimes you hear about using a seed drill, something that sticks the, 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 the seed into the ground. We don't, I don't necessarily like that. You'll find um, I think a lot of people are always surprised when they're dealing with a, a, a good quality wildflower mix is a lot of the seed sizes are really, really small. So that's why just being broadcast on the surface, we find tends to lead to the best results from a germination in an establishment. So something to keep in mind, you're not ever really burying the seed, you're just surface broadcasting the seed, and then we're going to follow it up with a compression of the seed into the soil. So we've broadcast our seed. And here we're see good seed to soil contact. Just if you were just doing a little planter, you take the palm of your hand, just press it. A little larger area here, I'm stepping on a piece of cardboard just to compress the seed for good seed to soil contact. Larger areas, you could use a lawn roller, works very well. You could put a lawn roller on the back of a tractor. Something just to get that seed to soil contact because it will help speed up germination. And when I say that, the difference can be anywhere from, you might see five to 10 day difference by compressing versus not compressing. A lot of times people will be sowing on a slope. It's a very popular area to establish meadow and flowers because it's a, it's a nuisance to mow. You have a sloped area, you might not be able to cover it. It's not the end of the world, but it will help speed up germination. Yes, the birds are gonna come and they're gonna eat some of the seed, don't worry. Just to give you an idea, there are approximately a quarter million seed in one pound of our wildflower mixes. That will vary, but there's about, so the birds and the squirrels and the chipmunks are gonna come and they're gonna peck a few seeds here and there, but don't worry, it won't have any impact on the outcome of your garden. And then once I've sown my seed, if possible, 
the sooner you can get some moisture to it, that will also help trigger and promote germination. And again, if you don't have access to water, try to plan your planting around some moisture in the forecast. So a lot of times I will do that because I don't like to water, even though I have water accessibility, I'm just relying on mother nature. And so I'm gonna plan my planting around some moisture in the forecast. And that usually works pretty well. So we've sown our seed, we've compressed it, and we're kind of on our way here. Here is a couple of meadows uh, being sown by hand by uh, with seed here. And then the one below, that's a raised bed I have on one of my properties where I established a mini meadow just using plugs in a raised bed. And so again, if you are dealing or going to use plant uh, material, which is a great way to establish a mini meadow, the one thing I will keep in mind is that it can be um, more expensive. And so just keep that in mind when you're planting, because again, one of the attractions to establishing a meadow or a mini meadow from seed is it's a much, it can be a much more cost-effective way to do, it, especially when you're dealing with large areas. But if you are going to use plant material, plugs, et cetera, which can be done, just keep in mind that when you're budgeting, from a budgeting standpoint, it can be a little more uh, expensive. But again, one of the upsides is you can get a little quicker results, obviously buying that plant material that could be a couple of years old. So your meadow is sown, we're on our way. Your meadow is alive. What to expect in troubleshooting your meadow? And we kind of do like a 30, 60 and 90 days. So 30 days. <clears throat> and again, dealing with a high quality wildflower mix that's lab tested, you've sown it, you compressed it, you had moisture present. Germination can happen as quick as five to 10 weeks. You should begin seeing little sprouts. It could take up to two weeks. If you've sown your meadow and 20 days have gone by and you're not seeing anything, that should be a red flag. You'd want to give the company that you bought the seed from a call and say, hey, it's been 20 days. I have seen nothing. There's no germination has happened. Let's begin to try to troubleshoot. So lack of germination, nothing has happened. Um, things have begun to germinate, but I can't tell if it's a grass or it's a weed. Don't worry about that. Be patient. I can't tell you how many times that someone sowed a meadow and things begin to germinate and grow and they don't know what's a weed, what's a flower. So they just begin pulling and they send me a photo of a pile of the weeds that they pulled, which were their beautiful lupin and echinacea and cosmos, et cetera. So can't stress enough, especially in those 30 days, rather wait, continue to see how things develop. And then if need be, you can email me a picture of what to look for. But a nice evenly sown meadow, you should see similar type of flowers, similar type of vegetation, evenly distributed and growing throughout the meadow. And again, important as we know the different life cycles of the plants that are growing in there, if there are annuals in there that they're gonna come into bloom in 60 days or whatever the case may be. And if we're dealing with perennials, they're not gonna flower the first year, but things such as echinacea and lupin and, and daisies, chrysanthemums, et cetera, they're pretty easy to identify. So it be, you begin that learning process of what those little seedlings look like. So that way you can really set the tone and really understand how that metal will continue to develop and have more confidence as things begin to grow, what should be pulled and what might not you might not want to pull. So just important there. But again, just stress enough to be patient, especially during those first 30, 60 days. Again, through my experience, get a lot of calls from people they're nervous, they're anxious, and you get into 60, 65 days and things begin to flower and they're, um, they're pleasantly surprised as their meadow begins and starts to bloom, et cetera. So just patience during those first you know, 20 to 30 days, really important. And again, we get into 60 days or whatever the case may be, more vegetation. And again, you should see similar types of plants throughout your meadow. Um, again, having an understanding of, am I going to see flowers the first year? If you put annuals in there, you certainly should. And it's also important, again, dealing with a reputable seed company you, with the list of the flowers that are going to be in your mix, you should also give, it will give you the bloom times as well. So I think it's important to understand that. I get a lot of people who they want to, or they come with me, they come to me with a list to do a custom blend because we do a lot of custom mixes. And 
They say, Mike, here are my seven favorite flowers. I say, oh, this is great. They didn't realize that those seven flowers all bloom in the middle of the summer and they have nothing for a late summer, fall, and they don't have anything early. So it's important and, and I'm constantly educating people on understanding the various bloom times of flowers so that we have flowers that are in bloom throughout the whole season to really enjoy and maximize that growing season. And again, at American Meadows, we have over 50 types of mixtures and most of the mixes that we sell will give you continuous blooms throughout the course of the season. So that's really important. And again, it's not only at American Meadows, but any reputable seed company can walk you through and help educate you to make sure that the mixture that you may be choosing is gonna give you that consistent flowers through not only throughout the first season, but also in subsequent seasons with those perennials. So you have continuous bloom throughout the entire season. It's really important. So you get into 60 days in your meadow, then you get into 90 days in your meadow. And again, you know, if this the photo up top there with a bunch of the Cosmos Bipinatus first year, that's first year annual color. So that would be expected. And you'd understand that in that first year, boom, you have those colors in that first year really comes to life. You, have, you see the, the, the um, smaller meadow that's along this fence line here, that is second, third year growth from Rubecchia's. That's in the middle of the summertime. So you've got some Rubecchia herta in there, you've got some Rubecchia gloriosa, um, and then there's some echinacea in there, which doesn't bloom until a little bit later. But again, just important understanding those life cycles of annuals and perennials and that expectation in, in getting to learn what is in bloom and what blooms at certain times of the year makes and it's a lot of the fun in creating a meadow. Um, you've got some borage uh, in bloom there with that bee, et cetera. So again, just really important with those life cycles and understanding your meadow and what comes into bloom at what time. You know, again, a lot of these, this photo here, these two are, this is all first year color coming from some annuals. This is a pollinator habitat that I have on my property. Um, the picture above um, with the child there, that is over a septic uh, system, which <laughs> I was funny, but it's probably the top five places that people will establish a meadow on top of an area where they just had gotten some work done on their septic, et cetera. So I always kind of get a chuckle out of that because it's just something through the years. I must get during the peak of the season, one call a week of someone who's going to establish a meadow on a septic area. So a uh, great place for it. Um, and again, not all meadows are big. Here's small railroad ties meadow out in Arizona. <clears throat> again, a lot of, excuse me, first year color there with those, um, with some of the annuals. You've got Papaver in there, Cosmos Geofrioris, Coreopsis tinctoria, et cetera. And then you have a nice set of established perennials. And the nice thing about that photo there is they've created that setting. <clears throat> and I think that's important. And we'll talk a little about this as far as the different types of meadows and inspiration for meadows. This sitting area amongst those perennials is a, is a great way. It's a lot of people, I will always ask them, like, how do you want to enjoy your meadow? What do you want to get out of it? Do you want to do, maybe you want to do cup bouquets, photography, you just want to go out and sip a cocktail out there, et cetera. So things to think about when you're planning the size and the shape, because they come in all different shapes and sizes. And again, that's a lot, a, a big part of the fun. So again, these are customers, um, the current customers I work with. Um, this one, the photo here <clears throat> on the left with the cars, uh, that's what we call a hell strip. It's that grassy area between the sidewalk and the street. This is in uh, downtown Burlington here, a colleague of mine. Um, they were just sick of it being mowed and they called up the city and they said, hey, we want to establish a little mini meadow on this tail strip. So they went out there and they, and they prepped it and they created this beautiful swath of, of color there. And again, great for bringing in and attracting pollinators, especially in that suburban setting, recreating some of that habitat. The stone house you see there, that is for a, that's in uh, Rhode Island along the coast. That's a, a house that's uh, featured in uh, Landscape Architect Magazine. And they had a, that was a larger meadow there. That was about a, a, an acre uh, to an acre and a half of a custom mixture that I created for them. Uh, they were sick of mowing and maintaining it. And they said, Mike, we're going to till all this up and we want to put in a meadow. And um, a real fun project there. But um, again, a, a great way to, to cut down on, on the, their carbon footprint there, of all the maintenance that goes into a meadow and the pesticides and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we have our meadow and it's in bloom and we're really enjoying it. And this, it's, the main, it's maintenance and suggestions during that first year. So with our meadow in general, 
and the maintenance is we always do recommend knocking it down once a year. Now, when we say knock it down is just cutting it some way to cut it down. You could mow it, you could weed whack it, something just to knock it down. And what that is doing is help disperse the ripened seeds that the flowers produce at the end of the growing season. But <clears throat> I think a number of years ago, I used to recommend cutting it down in the fall, but I've kind of changed that a little bit and kind of going to more so of knocking it down in the early spring. And the reason I've been saying that, and we get back to trying to support pollinators and pollinator habitat is keeping those seed heads in the, in, in the seedlings and the debris and in, in, in the dead, let's say dead, the, 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 the stalks and the, and the flowers there through the winter without disturbing them because pollinators will go in there and nest. So cutting it down or cutting it back once a year, I've been recommending to people to do that in the spring and you wanna wait in the spring until after you've had at least a week or two of temperatures above 50 degrees, because by then the, the, the nesting creatures would have woken up and kind of left the nest. So not cutting it down once a year, ideally doing it in the early spring. If for whatever reason you're not able to, maybe you're too busy in the spring and you wanna do it in the fall, it's okay. Um, something just again, just to knock it down, which again will help disperse the ripened seeds that the farmers produce. The fall can also be a good time to add more seed. Um, so let's say your meadow filled in, but there were some bare spots. So the fall is a good time to identify and address those. Maybe there's some spots where you had more weeds and grass than you would have liked. You can go on there with a steel rake or maybe just pulling them by hand, roughing up and then sprinkling some more seed either in the late fall, or you could add some seed in the spring as well too. So again, another way to address some of those bare spots to do potentially a top dressing to fill in. Um, and then you can also collect your own seed uh, at various times of the year is a lot of fun. Um, just keep in mind, <clears throat> again, this is, I always, I enjoy this is you have a meadow and you could go out and you could collect uh, a jar or two or a bag or three bags of seed and seed heads and seed pods and you're all excited and you go out and you sell it or you start it in a certain area and you don't get good results. Don't get discouraged. Just remember when you're buying seed from a, a, a quality seed company, all the seed has been lab tested. So we wean out all the, the crappy seed. When you collect your own seed, which is fun, you might not get great germination from that small crop that you collect. So don't get discouraged, just something to keep in mind. Sometimes people expect that they're just gonna go out and, and collect their own seed and it's gonna be at a 85% germination rate, which isn't normally gonna be the case. So just something to keep in mind, but collecting seed is a lot of fun. If you've never gone out and opened up the seed pods for milkweed, it's a ton of fun. And again, as I mentioned with my 10 year old daughter, we have a lot of fun going out and collecting milkweed seed or, or echinacea seed is so easy. It forms right at the top there. We usually have a lot of competition with the birds that are around, et cetera, but it's, it's a lot of fun. So, um, and sometimes more so when dealing with larger areas, um, you may sometimes hear about uh, burning an area, um, which can be an effective way to, to maintain an area. I normally, as you can imagine from legality standpoints, um, I don't recommend burning to customers because God forbid, if I recommended it to you and you then burned your house down, that would not be good. So um, most of the time it's, it's on a larger scale. Um, and if you were thinking about using uh, burning to maintain and uh, make sure before you do anything that you consult with your local fire department and get the right permits, et cetera, for that. But maintenance for a meadow, basically cutting it down once a year. You could do it in the late fall. I prefer to recommend you do it in the early spring and then adding some more seed, possibly in the late fall or in the spring as well too. A good time to, to, to potentially um, boost up your meadow if need be. So other reasons or why people may put in a meadow, planting meadows with a purpose. Um, and I've touched on a number of these throughout my presentation here. Um, planting for erosion control, really, really popular. You've got that steep area. It's a nuisance to mow. It's a pain in the butt. Um, doesn't doesn't uh, uh, hold soil very well. Really popular because, again, with the root structure of wildflowers and the durability of those perennials, they're really good for that erosion control. 
Um, the Hell Strip Meadow I mentioned earlier, that kind of area between the sidewalk and the, and the uh, street. Uh, I have one in front of my house. Great place to establish some habitat, um, some color, some beautification to, to your neighborhood. Um, a deer resistant meadow. I get a lot of people in the Northeast, um, in New York, et cetera, Pennsylvania area, lots of meadow, uh, lots of deer around. Um, they can be a nuisance. The great thing about a lot of wildflower varieties, they don't tend to be high on the list um, for um, edibles for deer. So they can be a great solution for creating some habitat on your property that keeps some of the deer um, at bay. Obviously, as we've talked about throughout the presentation, how critical establishing a meadow or mini meadow can be for um, host plants for pollinators and just supporting pollinators and pollinator habitat in general. Um, establishing a meadow in areas that tend to be very damp or wet, again, those can be challenging from a mower, from a, from a tiller standpoint. Adding some things like joe pie weed and various monardas, et cetera, are, do very, very well in areas that tend to be damp throughout the, the entire year. So getting back to understanding the soil and your soil conditions and the type that you're trying to establish, if it's wet or even if it happens to be dry, let's say you're dealing with a very sandy soil, very well drained, when it rains, the rain just seeps through. It's good to understand that because then you can begin to, to buy and pick plants um, in seeds and varieties that do well in those various conditions. So, you know, these are just, there's a number of others, but these are just some of the more popular um, uh, ways and in, 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 in reasons why people will establish a meadow on their property. And so here again, just some more ins inspirational photos for you. That's again, Lily in her, in her first year meadow over her septic area right after, the, shortly after they built their property. You've got some bees on some zinnia here. Um, here again, getting back to how I define meadows and mini meadows, this was just a little planter. They sprinkled a small pack of seed and you've got cineglossum in there, you've got some linearia, you've got some larkspur. Again, just adding and in, in creating some beauty. This was somebody here that took their walkway to their house and got rid of the lawn and created this beautiful um, swath of, of meadow there, really nice. Again, <clears throat> obviously supporting the pollinators with Asclepius, the bees there going into the Asclepius and the railroad ties there really nice. Um, <clears throat> again, this was uh, my pollinator habitat on my property where I took away some of the lawn and established the other photo there, <clears throat> that small, um, again, kind of a hell strip planting. That's a client of mine in a small town in Switzerland. And I've been working with them for about 10 years now. And he started with a small patch on his property and his little village enjoyed it so much that they went around town now and they plant those little swaths of mini meadows all throughout the downtown area. It's really, really cool. Here, a couple of projects. So again, when you're thinking about establishing a mini meadow on your property, how do you want to enjoy it? This was a great photo where they put a little walkway through their meadow so they can go out in the middle of it and probably take some photos and really enjoy it from different angles and different um, directions, which is really cool. Um, the photo there at Sunday River Ski Resort in Maine, um, that was a custom mix I did for them where on their slopes during the summertime, they're sick of maintaining and, and mowing it back. So they planted a bunch of wildflowers in it. So again, uh, another way of establishing and, and, and being inspired to, to put in some, some meadows there on, a, on obviously on a much larger scale. So hopefully through this presentation, I've, I've inspired you to, to, to get excited and think about putting a mini meadow uh, on your property. Um, certainly um, that this is gonna wrap up my presentation. I know I went through it pretty quickly. Um, I hope that we have, um, you have some questions for me because I am here uh, to answer all the questions you might have. Like I said, we will have the presentation on PowerPoint, so you can share it, you can go back um, and review it as well too. So um, again, wanna thank you for having me. Hopefully if I, I've inspired you to plant a mini meadow on your property. Um, we are, I don't think we mentioned, but we are gonna have a, a raffle. I think we're gonna take all the attendee, everyone who signed up and put them in a hat and I'm gonna pick a, a winner and we're gonna get a copy of my book sign a copy of my book and we'll send you a pound of our regional pollinator mixture as well too so you can put in your meadow. So um, thanks again for having me. This was great. And I guess we're gonna open it up um, to any questions that you may have.
Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really inspiring. Great photos and um, definitely a lot to think about and um, hopefully start some meadows. So I'm going to open up some questions here. And um, so first question here uh, looks like it says, uh, Mike, the city sowed grass seed and it's still cool. Should I be watering it? The city sowed grass. Um, I, I personally wouldn't be watering it yet. Um, assuming this person is in Illinois, um, yes. where you are, and it's you know still on the cooler side, I wouldn't worry about watering it yet because my hunch is that your ground temperatures are probably still on the cool side. So even if you were to water, it's probably not really going to stimulate the germination that you're looking for. I would just kind of let the seeds stay there and let the ground continue to warm up. I think you mentioned you've got some warmer temperatures coming. Hopefully with some warmer temperatures, that will trigger germination. And shortly after the seed is germinated, that's when I would apply water, but I wouldn't be watering just yet because I just don't, it's kind of a waste at this point. It's a little bit early for that. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, is there a mix that can be planted near a walnut tree? Yeah, there is actually, you could, um, and this is again, the nice thing about when I talk about um, wildflowers and how durable they can be, you'd be pleasantly surprised that there are a, there are a number of wildflower species in particular strong perennials, um, some things like Menardes, um, some Joe pie weeds, um, some Asclepias that can be planted there and the toxicity isn't going to impact them. And so again, wildflowers, great solution for that area. Perfect. That is definitely a troublesome area for many. It can be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, how about can the wildflowers help a fallen down rock wall? Um, I mean, I guess it would just depend on. I mean, I would say yes because, of course, that's probably a biased uh, answer. But <laughs> I think a lot of it would just depend on the aesthetic or the look that you're trying to achieve. I think if you were looking like, let's say you um, hypothetically had a rock wall and it had fallen down and you know there was rocks there, you could certainly, um, some things that come to mind are creating like a low profile, kind of almost like a ground cover-ish that could creep down below it, something like that. Um, I think you would just have to plan on that accordingly, unless you wanted, because most wildflowers in general, they're gonna be average between two to four feet in height. So that height could be a little detrimental because it could block the rock wall from an aesthetic viewing standpoint. So again, when dealing with a reputable seed company and getting recommendations for trying to solve for that, it's not out of the question. It's certainly doable. I think it would just be the personal preference of this person as far as what they're the look they're trying to achieve. And yes, it could be established with incorporating wildflowers. Great. Oh, how do you handle tree seedlings, especially in larger areas? Yeah, that can be challenging because we have a lot of oak on ours and dropping egg corns like crazy and so on. So, I mean, most of the time I'm pulling them and the reason I'm pulling, which can be, is not fun, but I'm not using, um, I'm not using an herb, I'm not bringing herbicides or chemicals onto the property. So, you know, you, it, depending on how you feel, potentially there are chemical applications. I'm not a big fan of using chemicals. So unfortunately for better or worse, um, I'm pulling those. Um, you know, I think sometimes it'll come down to personal preference. Sure. Um, and then what if you can't mow your meadow? There are rocks in the soil and it's in town. Um, Sandra has been breaking off the larger plants in the spring. Do you have yep. any recommendations? I mean, yeah, if you're not able, certainly if you're not able to get a mower across because there's rocks or whatever, um, sometimes you can find those old handheld sickle bar, sickle, I don't know, the cutters or whatever, and you're just going to cut it. Because again, you don't have to scalp it. It doesn't have to be like perfectly manicured. All we're looking is just to knock down those seed heads. So I will go out with my weed whacker and just weed whack it down, you know, something, and I'm not going anywhere near the ground. I'm keeping mine cut like five, six inches, you know, because you'll be pleasantly surprised just knocking it down. Within a few months um, in the early spring, 
that new growth, my lupins, my echinacea, my rubeckias, or it already it comes up so quickly in those cuttings in the dead debris there, you don't even notice it. You don't even see it anymore. Sure. Um, so if you have annuals the first year to continue the next year, do you reseed it and kind of start over or rely on it to, to self-seed? Sure. So to answer that, it's going to be personal preference. I can tell you, can tell you in our experience at American Meadows, it's super, super popular. The, our mixtures that we sell actually combine both annuals and perennials. And for the reason of everyone wants instant gratification. They like the fruits of their labor. They did all this work to prep. I want to get color the first year. You can get that from those annuals. But they also want the perennials to come back year after year. So a lot of our mixtures have a mix of annuals and perennials. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. But to answer the question, that's all personal preference. But it's important to know that if you were to go just annuals, yes, you would probably have to do the prep work of planting them every year. Because assuming your customers are Illinois, I'm in Vermont, it's not very likely that our annuals are gonna self-sow at the abundance we would like. Our winters tend to be really cold. So you don't get the reseeding that you get if you lived in the Carolinas or Virginia or Georgia where they have mild winters. So like things like zinnias and cosmos and poppy, down there, they recede for them really uh, relatively aggressively. In the Northeast, in the Midwest, it's not as likely. So if I'm talking to someone and they like annuals, I'm always recommending you're probably going to have to plant them every year because the chances of them self-sowing are not as robust as if you lived in a warmer climate. Sure. And just to, to build on that, since you since you brought that up, would you, um, I'm throwing in my own question here, but uh, would you do that after you cut everything down then and just kind of follow that up in the spring? That's exactly correct. Yep. 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 Perfect. And, and, and it will, it'll depend on, you know, how much preparation you may want to do after you've cut it back. You might take a steel rake and just rough up some pockets and just do a top dressing of some of those annuals every year, if, if that's what you're, you're looking to do, yes. <clears throat> Great. Um, is there a certain type that works well on a big hill? Yeah, certainly um, if I am going to recommend somebody who's sowing on a hill, a steep hill, I'm always gonna recommend uh, on a, a high percentage of the meadow be in perennial. Now, perennial are flowers that come back year after year, but more importantly, when I'm dealing with a hillside, I want structure, I want uh, roots and structure. And perennials establish root structure to help hold the soil from erosion. So if I was going to recommend to somebody seeding on a slope, you can guarantee that the majority of the flowers that are going to be in that mix are going to be perennial based. You know, uh, echinaceas, lupins, uh, chrysanthemums, um, uh, uh, monardas, uh, asclepias, etc there's gonna be a high concentration of perennials because perennials are flowers that tend to establish the root structure that are much better off at holding the soil, uh, especially for erosion purposes. Sure, and um, uh, kind of building on that, when you first seed um, on a hill then, um, would you recommend covering it with anything while it's still establishing? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, I would. Um, and I didn't really touch on that in my presentation because we were in our presentation, we were just doing a nice flat area. Sure. When you are dealing with a sloped area, I will recommend that you do a coverage of straw and make sure it's straw, not hay, because hay can contain seeds. So do straw. And when you're covering with straw, we don't want to put it on so dense like we may be familiar with when we're doing grass. We want to put, we want, we still want to cover it, but we we want to make sure that sunlight and moisture is able to penetrate it so it doesn't um, hamper germination. So a coverage of straw, but more you know, on the light side per se. Um, still want to be able to see pockets of soil peeking through there because again, ultimately we want that germination to take place. Great. Um, 
here from Amy. We purchased a small rundown par three golf cart course that is no longer a course, just a residence. Is there mm -hmm. something that can be planted on the old greens? It's mostly sand and weeds now. Well, as long as there are weeds and the area supports growth, weeds, grass, et cetera, yes, you probably could establish wildflowers there. Um, I actually sell in, um, I sell to golf courses all over the country because it's a very cost effective way, not only to beautify, but as you can imagine, the cost savings of having to mow their fairways in, in, um, you know, in, in some of those dead areas. So wildflower plantings has been huge, very popular on golf courses. But again, getting back to uh, when I started my presentation and just like looking around and, and um, seeing what's currently growing in the area, as long as the area supports growth, grass, weeds, et cetera, even if it's sandy, um, it's probably going to, to establish and you probably can create some nice meadows on that property. Sure. And in an area that is um, that is that that has a lot of weeds um, that's been kind of left for a few years is, of your preparation methods, is there a recommended one? Um, no, not really. I mean, they all can be just as, as effective. I just think the key there is number one, spending the time to do it and do it right. But just once you've identified whether you are going to solarize or you're going to till or use a chemical application or organic uh, chemical application, just take in consideration the time it can take. Because I think that's where people tend to trip up is they don't realize, like they say, well, Mike, I like this idea of solarization. Great. Well, I want to do my planting in June, but I'm not starting my solaration till May. That's not going to work. So they all can be very effective, um, but just planning accordingly, understanding them and then planning accordingly. But, you know, just because it's a, an area that has maybe been <clears throat> an old hay field or in this case, a, a golf course that's been dormant, that, that's OK. You know, um, solarization can be just in, as impactful as as doing a surface till, but it's just spending the time and doing it properly. That's most important. Perfect. Um, what about wildflowers for a shady area? Sure, that, that's a great question. So it certainly can be done. And again, the durability and, and one of the, the reasons why pop wildflowers are so popular is they can establish in what I call a semi-shady area. But I think, and this is the, the big thing is, is, as I mentioned in my presentation, is defining shade or part shade. So ideally, if you were going to start your meadow from seed, you would want at least four hours of sun or more a day. If the area is getting less than four hours of sun, you could still establish a meadow, but you may end up having to go with plants or plugs. So again, just planning appropriately. And if you have to go the plant material route, just keep in mind that it may be a little more expensive, but can it be done? Yes. And again, it also gets back to um, in the area that you may be thinking about establishing a meadow, if it happens to be shady is analyzing, just looking like what's growing there now. If it's shady and there's a lot of bare spots where there's nothing growing there, that probably tells me it's not getting, you know, very, very limited sun. And number one, you may have to address the soil um, and that could come with a soil test. And then number two, determining, hey, I think I may go the plant and vegetation route versus seeds. If it's an area and it's only getting three or four hours of sun, but there's, you know, you look around and there's grass and there's weeds there, it's probably actually getting more sunlight than you realize in that sowing your meadow from seed probably is actually going to work pretty well. So yes, sowing in partially shade or shady areas can work, but again, just it's kind of determining how much shade there actually is there and planning appropriately, whether you go establishing from seed versus plant material. Great. Um, what about planting in and around boulders? Again, <clears throat> great place for establishing. It gets back to, you know, around those boulders, is there soil and enough nutrient content in the soil to establish vegetation? And again, that could come from a soil test, but it could also come from just looking. You could have boulders there, but if there's you know, soil growing around those boulders that's supporting growth, grass and weeds, you're probably in good shape. 
If there isn't and it's bare, you may have to bring in some topsoil or organic matter to build up or create a soil substance to support um, the establishment of, of a meadow or, or flower. So um, kind of more on a case by case basis, but just looking for um, what's currently growing there. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, I'm gonna, um, that looks like all of our questions on Zoom so far, so far, keep sending those in. I'm gonna check on Facebook here real quick. Sure, and these are all great, great questions and uh, I've answered them many, many times. <laughs> Well, I'm, well, I'm not seeing any questions on Facebook. Okay. So I think we're good there. Let's check here. Any, any other questions um, here on Zoom? Send them in here uh, real quick. If you've, if you've got them, we do have some time um, still available. I can answer a few of the most common questions we're getting right now. Oh, I know sure. sure. One of the questions we're getting right now is people thinking like they're too late to plant. And so being in the Northeast and you guys are in the Midwest, we're like in prime planting time right now, even in our area of the Northeast, quite frankly, we're still like a little bit early. And the reason I say that is our ground temperatures are warming up and the air temperatures, like I think it's going to be in the seventies later this week, which is awesome. But as we were talking about before we opened up the forum here is the, the, what we run into in the Northeast is like, we could get frost still, or we could get like three inches of snow still. So <laughs> if I try to gamble and put my mini meadow out early, and let's say the seed actually does begin to germinate, the little seedlings can be very susceptible to cold weather. Now it's one thing if we have a frost predicted and it gets to 32 or 30, and then it bounces right back warm again and we're good to go. But unfortunately, where we live in the Northeast, we could get a frost next week and that frost could be like 20 degrees and that would zap my mini meadow. Ugh. So being living where we are, you know, I always recommend people to, to, to play it on the safe side, sometimes plant a little later than try to gamble and plant a little early. But we are, you know, we're kind of in that prime planting time or, or we're not quite there yet. But when is it too late to plant being in the Midwest and the Northeast? We kind of have this luxury where like now through mid to end of June is a great time to be establishing a meadow. Um, so you kind of have, you know, a nice month to month and a half here that, you know, is, is a great time to, to be putting in, um, putting in a meadow or thinking about putting in a meadow. So even like early June, mid June, still have time in the Midwest and Northeast where you could still establish uh, a, a nice patch of flowers. So something to, to keep in mind, you're not late and uh, you still, you know, um, you still got a nice month, month and a half window to be planting. Sure. Do you find that um, uh, the later that, that you would sow a meadow from seed, uh, if you did wait until June or so, um, do you recommend a little bit more maintenance that first year as far as watering and that sort of thing so that the little seedlings don't um, fry in the heat? Yeah, <laughs> fry out. Yeah, def yeah, definitely. But that said, again, kind of taking advantage of where we live, like in the Midwest and Northeast, we don't really like even mid June here in Vermont, like we're in the 70s and like low 80s. It's like primo time. Sure. Now, obviously, if it went to the 90s and it was, you know, early June, yes, you, you may have to, well, potentially water it more or give it more care or hope that we get some moisture in the forecast. But again, being where we are, not, you know, that early June timeframe, we're still like on the cooler side, which again, makes it optimal for sowing. But yes, to answer your question, if you could, or if the temperatures all of a sudden did spike up into the mid 80s, high 80s, low 90s, it would be ideal to get some moisture to it just to kind of speed up the germination and the growing process um, to eliminate some of that stress that could occur from that, that unusual heat that, could, um, that you could experience at that time of year. Yeah, perfect. Um, 
All right, uh, another question. We got two more that came in. Um, what do you know about the jumping worms? If anything, nothing. I don't nothing. No. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. They're they're kind of they're not necessarily new per se, but there's been more research, and I'm not. Uh, I don't know quite as much about them either. Um, besides, they are not the type of worms we want in the garden. Um, Jumping worms. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I learn stuff at these. So yeah, yeah it's um, not something that I've heard from customers or sure. you know complaints or anything but again I haven't it's not something that's come up but now sure. I'm intrigued so I'm going to go do some yeah research. look it up I would recommend um uh the question came from from normally so um there has been some um information that's come out through uh various extension services mm -hmm. um Illinois extension did a program on it Wisconsin extension um, UW Extension has done some research on it. They are um, collecting more information. If you think that you may have them, um, you can go ahead and um, submit a sample, submit a photo, that sort of thing to try to get that identified. They are trying to, to track where exactly they're at. And I do know they are here um, in Winnebago County, um, you know, where, where Clem is located and where, where many of our attendees um, live and so um, do if you if you do have more questions um, you can reach out to to me um, through email or or out at Clem you could stop in or or call um, I'm by no means an expert but um, I have learned a little bit about it myself um, through through extension and so so look that up um, and let us know let us know what else. Um, what else you might have for questions? Um, yeah, I see you don't want them. <laughs> yeah, we definitely, nobody wants them really. Um, uh, so thanks for that question. Um, another question here that uh, you are more attuned to, um, are you shipping to Wisconsin for the spring yet? Um, yep, we are. Perfect. Yep. We ship our seeds. So <clears throat> let me rephrase that. So not only do we specialize in seed, and that's our, my specialty especially, but we do, plant material as well too. We do bare roots up to four inch pots and then we do bulbs as well too. Our plant material, we are not shipping to Wisconsin just yet because our goal when we ship our plant material is that we want you to, we want it to be the proper planting time in your zone. So we ship those on a zone schedule. The beauty of wildflower seed is we're shipping our seed year round all the time because it stores very, very well. So let's say you had an area and you were gonna put in a meadow and you had a thousand square feet and you actually bought two pounds of seed, which would be more than enough. You could, you, you basically have almost an extra pound of seed. You could store that seed. If you keep it room temperature and keep it dry, you could store that seed for up to 12 to 24 months. And it's going to keep a very high germination rate, which again, as I mentioned, all the seed we sell is lab tested. So something to keep in mind, but yes, we, so we don't hold seed or, you know, um, delay shipping on our seed. It's constantly going out the door. We're shipping that year round, et cetera, because we network with growers all over the country um, on our various species and mixes that we formulate. Um, and so we have fresh crops of seed coming in um, year round. So we always kind of guarantee like the freshest quality seed possible because, and it also, as I mentioned, is all lab tested to, to, to guarantee that as well. That's, that's great. Um, I do see a question here over on Facebook um, from Gretchen. Um, she says that wild geraniums are taking over the yard. Are they invasive? Um, and if I want a strip along my fence, how do I prevent any invasive species? I don't, I can't say 100% if they're invasive where she specifically is. They're aggressive. There's no doubt about it. And you know, they, it can be, they can be challenging. Um, I've had good luck pulling them. I know sometimes that's easier said than done because I don't know how big an, an area she's dealing with, but they can be aggressive. And so if there were geranium, wild geraniums present and you might not be able to eradicate them or it can be challenging. What I would recommend is if you were planting some species, some wildflowers or wildflower mixes, getting back to leaning more towards some more aggressive perennials, things that can compete with the geranium, you know, things like, like the echinaceas, like the, 
lupins, like the chrysanthemums, like the minorities, like they're just as aggressive and they would be able to compete once they were established and uh, co-mingle with something like a wild geranium. But I, because in the Northeast here, we don't consider geranium invasive, but it is aggressive. Yeah, definitely um, strong growers. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. But again, I mean, I think keeping an open mind and finding compatible plants versus like, I mean, in obviously easier said than done than taking like thinking at thinking about it as a nuisance, like, hey, what could I grow with it potentially? If I can't eradicate it, what could I grow with it that could be compatible? And kind of thinking it thinking about it in that mindset sometimes can be a little more uh, inspiring. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right. Oh, it says uh, she replied she's on an acre. Um, definitely a, a bigger area. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, again, I mean, I, like I said, uh, for an acre, you know, and she was going to sow some of that with a meadow, I would plan on um, some really nice, hardy, aggressive perennials to that will be able to compete and be compatible with, with the geranium. Perfect. Don't be just um, don't get discouraged because there's plenty of you know perennial meadow flowers that will be able to co-mingle and cohabitat with that geranium. Great. Okay, let's see. We've got any more questions that have come in. I don't see any more questions. Um, if there's any other, um, you know, really popular or most common questions that um, that you receive that you might want to share, that might be something, you know, maybe we hadn't thought of yet. Um, love to hear that. Otherwise, um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, you, we really appreciate uh, Mike. We appreciate you being here. Um, we've still got. Um, a good handful of people on here. So if, uh, if you could think of any other um, kind of common popular things that you'd like to share with us, um, yeah, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, getting back to, you know, the preparation uh, for, you know, preparing your meadow and, and spending the time and doing it right, I think is really important. You know, I know we all get busy and I think, um, you know, <laughs> try to cut corners and stuff. And I can't stress enough, like, not only in the short term, but in ultimately the long term success, the more time you put into that preparation, I think is really, really important. And so, you know, don't try to cut corners, you know, once you've identified the proper preparation method you're going to use, it's just plan accordingly. And then I, I think also too, in wanting to inspire and set people up to succeed, I think gar in gardening in general, we, we get excited, we get inspired, and we're all amped up to go out and do something in the spring, it's okay to start small and ease your way into it. I feel like a lot of times people bite off more than they can manage. And what ends up happening is life gets in the way. Um, all of a sudden in the midsummer, all those, the time you thought you were going to spend watering or weeding or maintaining your meadow gets interrupted by the rest of your life. And, and then we, we tend to, um, we get discouraged, you know, and we're like, ah, you know, that didn't, my garden didn't come out the way I wanted it to. And so just kind of advising people that like, for instance, the lady who has an acre and that's great, but maybe just, just start small and just do like a little small area first and learn and, and see what does well, what doesn't do well. And, you know, formulate kind of a game plan that you can then duplicate and expand as you go along. So that I think you know, and whether it's putting in a mini meadow or vegetable garden or putting in bulbs or whatever, we tend to get a lot of people and, and they want to bite off this big project when, you know, life, you just get busy and it's not a fault of anyone's in that. Sometimes it, there's nothing wrong with starting small and keeping it manageable. Learn as you go. And because I feel like you you potentially enjoy it a little bit more that way than trying to bite off that big project, getting sidetracked or discouraged along the way. And then giving up gardening, you know, in general. And so I think, uh, and it's funny because <clears throat> I guess in a way I'm 
in a sales role and I like to sell, but it's more so like setting somebody up to succeed. And even if it's talking them out of buying a 20 pound bag of seed and starting with a pound and getting them hooked on gardening so that they keep, you know, expanding and coming back year after year after year can sometimes be, is, is a lot more rewarding than having someone, you know, take on the 10 acre project and next thing you know, you know, life gets busy and, you know, they're discouraged. So. That's, that's great. Um, definitely. Um, what's been really inspiring is how much you've talked about how it could be a mini meadow and it doesn't have to be so large and it doesn't have to be what you traditionally think in your mind of it's just acres and acres of meadow. Right. We, it can be, you know, fit on a residential lot and that's great for, for a lot of us here listening. So yeah, that's absolutely. Perfect. I mean, my property is a typical suburban neighborhood. I think I'm on a third or a half an acre and, you know, we have people joggers and walkers and stuff. And as I mentioned, when we moved into our property eight years ago, first thing we did is ripped up a bunch of beautifully manicured lawn and put in our <laughs> mini meadow and put in our veggie garden. And I can't tell you how many compliments we get from people like they will, you know, all summer, um, whether I'm sharing my vegetable harvest or they, the color and how the meadow changes throughout the course of the season. And every day they walk by and something's different or my patch of Asclepius that I raise monarchs on, they're like, this is the coolest thing ever. And, you know, you don't see that in the typical suburban neighborhoods. And so it's, I, I enjoy it. It's fun, but it's inspiring. And people, you know, to, to see my neighbors really enjoy it too. It's, it's a lot of fun, you know, and again, I don't, I don't live on acres, you know, and uh, you can do it on a small little, little spot. You don't need, you know, uh, you don't need, you know, acres and acres of it. So. Perfect. Well, wonderful. Well, um, I, I want to say thank you one more time to you, Mike, for being with us. I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, if you uh, have any other questions, um, you can feel free to contact Mike. He's going to send me this yep. presentation. So yep. we'll post that to um, our website, plum.org, under our um, our learn section. We'll post uh, both the PowerPoint as well as the recording of this presentation. So if there's something you you know, you missed or anything, you want to go back, um, we'll be able to post that in um, a couple of days once we get the recording. And um, you can um, keep an eye out um, as well uh, for the um, for the raffle. We will uh, get all the names to Mike. And so uh, we'll contact the, the winner on uh, by email, uh, which is how you registered to uh, attend this. So that's exciting. And you can, if you, if you don't win, but you want to check out the book, you can purchase it from, um, from your website, AmericanMeadows.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. And then all major Amazon and all the major booksellers, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. Yep. So sure. Great. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope everybody has a uh, great evening and happy planting. We're, we're definitely getting anxious here. I'm getting anxious and, and ready to uh, gear up for spring and summer. So um, definitely a favorite time of year. Um, and I hope that uh, some of you have been inspired to, to put in a meadow. Awesome. Thanks again for having me. This was, this was great. And also too, if people have questions after the fact, if they do email you, you can forward them to me and be more than happy to answer them. Great. Perfect. Sounds wonderful. Well, um, have a good evening, everybody. Um, have a good evening there on the, on the East Coast. It's a little bit later for you. Um, and we will hopefully see some of you out at CLEM um, this week for Go Public Gardens Days um, or just anytime this this spring and summer. And thanks again for joining. Have a great evening. All right. I guess I could have turned this on, but thank you again. I appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. We'll, we'll uh, contact you with the, uh, um, the names of yep.